the May 2021 estimate of the population of the world is 7.9 billion people. That's nearly 8,000 million people living right now on planet Earth. Now that's staggering. 7.9 billion people living their lives in the world that God has made. Buying, selling, sleeping, eating, marrying, spending money. Today, we're going to look at the greatest of decisions ever. Time to get your Bibles and open up at Isaiah chapter 34. Let's get started. I'm Andrew Agnew. I'm one of the pastors here at The Living Room. Welcome to you online. We're gonna read two chapters today from the book of Isaiah, which cap off a lot of the prophecies that have been given in the last uh, number of chapters here in the book of Isaiah. This is part of Hezekiah's reign, where God has been warning the leaders not to trust in anybody else except for God. In chapter 33 last week, we saw the idea over and over again that God stands up, enough is enough. This is a reference to God intervening in human history. He was going to intervene in the history of Jerusalem, which is under, under attack from Assyria. But in these next chapters, we're going to see how God is going to stand up and say, right, time's up at the end of history as we know it. Let's read chapter 34, shall we? Draw near, O nations, to hear, and give attention, O peoples. Let the earth hear, and all that fills it, the world, and all that comes from it. For the Lord is enraged against all the nations and furious against all their host. He has devoted them to destruction, has given them over for slaughter. Their slain shall be cast out and the stench of their corpses shall rise. The mountains shall flow with their blood. All the host of heaven shall rot away and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall as leaves fall from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. For my sword has drunk its fill in the heavens. Behold, it descends for judgment upon Edom, upon the people I have devoted to destruction. The Lord has a sword. It is sated with blood. It is gorged with fat with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Bozra, a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Wild oxen shall fall with them, and young steers with the mighty bulls. Their land shall drink its fill of blood, and their soil shall be gorged with fat. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion, and the streams of Edom shall be turned into pitch and her soil into sulphur. Her land shall become burning pitch. Night and day it shall not be quenched. Its smoke shall go up forever from generation to generation. It shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the hawk and the porcupine shall possess it. The owl and the raven shall dwell in it. He shall stretch the line of confusion over it and the plumb line of emptiness. Its nobles there is none there to call it a kingdom, and all its princes shall be nothing. Thorns shall grow over its strongholds, nettles and thistles in its fortresses. It shall be the haunt of jackals and abode for ostriches. And wild animals shall meet with hyenas. The wild goat shall cry to his fellow. Indeed, there the night bird settles and finds for herself a resting place. There, the, the owl nests and lays and hatches and gathers her young in her shadow. Indeed, there the hawks are gathered, each one with her mate. Seek and read from the book of the Lord. Not one of these shall be missing. None shall be without her mate. For the mouth of the Lord has commanded and his spirit has gathered them. He has cast the lot for them. His hand has portioned it out to them with the line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation, they shall dwell in it. This is really uncomfortable reading, isn't it? And really it revolves around verse 8. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. 
That needs some picking apart, uh, which we're going to try to do as we get more familiar with the whole chapter. And so if you want to go back towards the beginning, from verses 1 to 4, we can see the widest possible scope for this judgment language. In verse 1, we find out that it's the whole of the world that is in scope. Um, all the peoples now, all the peoples that come from it, past and present, this is a time of reckoning. Draw near, everyone. Why? Because verse 2 says God is enraged. Up until now in this book, we have had God as a shelter. We've had God as waiting, as broken-hearted lover, as Lord of the angel armies, as broken-hearted parent. But now God is angry. He is furious, enraged. Death is the judgment given. And that graphic, verse 3, shows the fate of all who have fallen. And in verse 4, we even get the heavens, meaning the spiritual unseen realm that is left, that's not left out. This is a settling of accounts once and for all, extending from the earth to the heavens like a book being closed. And using the fruit trees as a simile, when the harvest is over, the tree is left bare. This is final judgment language. And from verses 5 through to the end of verse 9, we get the mention of Edom. And this gives us an insight into the who of the vengeance. Now, unless you've been reading the Bible recently, you may never have heard of Edom. It's a nation that's long since disappeared. Um, it was the nation of Esau, Jacob's brother. Um, Jacob, of course, had his name changed to Israel. And Esau became known as Edom. Um, and Edom is a nation which stood against the nation of Israel, especially when they were escaping from Egypt, going up through the wilderness and into the Promised Land. Edom didn't want to let them pass through. Edom here in chapter 34 of the book of Isaiah represents all those who oppose God's people. So God has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Now we can begin to understand a little bit more about what Isaiah is referring to here. You see, all through this book of Isaiah, we've had references to prophecies near and far. Things that would happen soon, things that would not happen for a long time. A bit like those mountain peaks, remember. Um, God's people here in Judah and Israel, well, they've been under attack. We've seen that from the Assyrians. Uh, but this seems to take us way, way beyond that to something even more far away in the future. In the New Testament, it takes us to see there that the people of God are now all of those people, no matter what their background or what their nationality, who follow Jesus. And you can read Romans chapter 2, you can read Romans chapter 9 for a fuller understanding of what I've just said. God has always stood up for his people and he always will. And so we move from final judgment to empty desolation in verses 9 to 15. And what we have there is this language of pitch and sulfur and burning. It's an allusion to Sodom and Gomorrah, of course, in Genesis chapter 19. Now in verse 11, at the very end of verse 11, we get God stretching out his measure over the land. It is God who judges. He sets the standard and humanity is now banished. It's gone. Nothing but animals are left to roam and weeds grow over where people used to live. Verse 10 shows that this judgment goes forever and ever. This judgment is eternal. Now, what is this chapter saying? God's wrath at the end of time is revealed. It's not hidden. It's not a mystery. It's not a surprise. Just remind yourself of verse 16. Seek and read from the book of the Lord. Not one of these shall be missing. God's plan is sure. For the last chapters, God has warned Judah, stop trusting in yourselves and stop trusting in the world. Here we discover that the world itself is destined for judgment. God will not allow this world to keep on going, disobeying him, ignoring him. And for those of us who are praying for brothers and sisters who live in countries around the world that experience some of the worst kinds of persecution that we can imagine, for example, North Korea or parts of the Middle East or in northern or sub-Saharan Africa where Christians are hated, 
They're denied jobs. They're imprisoned. They're thrown into concentration camps. They're killed. I know it's hard for us to believe things like that can happen in our world when we live in such a safe and peaceful part of the world. But if you were a Christian in Afghanistan or Eritrea or Somalia or parts of Pakistan or parts of India, even um, even Iran, you would be reading these words and be comforted that God has a day of vengeance and a year of recompense for the cause of God's people, Zion. God's not done. The problem with living in our peaceful and safe part of the world is that it's so easy to live in this illusion of self-reliance, self-trust, self-making, self-centeredness. Who needs God when we can live so easily? Make money, travel, buy, sell. Read and seek from the book of the Lord. None of these shall be missing. See, God has spoken. And and so it is as good as done when God says it. And that's an appropriate way for us to end chapter 34. Grim reading as it is. At least it's plain. At least we've been told in advance. Don't trust in human power. It's destined for destruction. And that should shake us back into reality. Maybe the reality of your own mortality has been staring at you back in the face. Coronavirus has made people question, but how soon viewing figures start to drop online, um, church services um, starts to slip as well, uh, the hope of being able to get back to normality beckons, uh, seeing and hugging family for some, um, all of a sudden God's back to the bottom of the pile of important things in our lives. Will you take time to go deeper? Take time to think about your own soul, your own standing before God. Well, what are you offering that's an alternative to that? Andrew, you might say, well, that's chapter 35. And so let's read it now. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They see, they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak knee, weak hands, and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then... The eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. What a transformation. I guess in the same way that verse 8 is the standout verse in chapter 34, verse 4 in chapter 35 is a standout verse, of course, as well. Um, Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. See, chapter 35 is a chapter of transformation. It's a chapter of salvation. It's a chapter of security. 
So first of all, we have the transformation of the land from barrenness to beauty. Now, apparently Lebanon and Carmel and Sharon were all places that were associated with beauty. The second half of verse six and into verse seven, of course, continue with this amazing transformation of the land. But it's the last part of verse two that really begs a question for me. I wonder if it does for you. Who are those who shall see the glory of the Lord? Who are these people who see the majesty of our God? Well, it takes to read much farther on down uh, to find out in verse 10, um, at the end of the chapter, um, who Isaiah is talking about, they are the ransomed of the Lord. That's who we find out. They're the who, who get to see all of these things. And this is meant to strengthen us. All of this is written to help us to feel so much stronger in what it is that we believe. And from the end of verse two to the end of verse six, we just get this amazing picture to help us to persevere in our walk with God. Help us not to succumb to fear. It says strengthen the weak hands and that's a call to action. Get to action. Get working hard. Um, It's a call to say make firm the feeble knees. So stand strong in what we know is the rock of our salvation. Stand strong in God and say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong. Fear not. Love those words. I think we can take courage from verses like these, because of course, Jesus came. Listen to John and chapter one and verse 14, listen to this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, why do I read that? Well, it's because Jesus came to this earth and showed us God's glory. He is the one whose face we shall see. Um, He dwelt among us. And so these people who wrote the Gospels, well, they saw him face to face. They knew who they were looking at. And so we have confidence that we don't believe in some kind of a delusion or some kind of hearsay. Uh, This is true eyewitness testimony. And I don't say any of this is some kind of, you know what, you just got to grit your teeth and you've just got to get through this. That would just be harsh and that would be really uncaring. This is a matter of fueling our faith. The ransomed of the Lord shall see the glory of the Lord. What hope we have now. It's enough to stiffen our resolve, enough to focus us to trust in God and not in our own strength and certainly not in the strength of the world. And verse five is that beautiful little taste of heaven, isn't it? Blind eyes seeing, deaf hearing, lame walking, mute singing. Now we understand why Jesus had his incredible healing ministry. And he did all the things that he did. They're what we are to expect. What Isaiah told God's people in the Old Testament, we expect when God is on the move and especially when he dwells among us. Just listen to chapter seven of um, the Gospel of Luke. And just quickly from verses um, 19 to 23. And John, that's John the Baptist, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord saying, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? In that hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk. People with leprosy are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus' answer to John the Baptist and his disciples confirmed what John would need to hear. The glory and the majesty of the Lord is prefigured through Jesus' healing ministry as a sign of what is to come. Jesus knew that John would recognize that. So John must have been seeking and reading from the book of the Lord to know that these would be the signs that God's king had come and that his kingdom was at hand. You would expect 
that when God says it, it's going to happen. John the Baptist had read and sought. Well, Jesus came to show us a little bit more about our, the experience of salvation, which, which involves strengthening as well as healing. And so we get to these final verses, verse 8 to 10, where we have the security of God's ransomed. One person I was reading in prep for this talk spoke about going into a travel agent. Have you ever gone into a travel agent and you see the posters up on the wall? And you see this incredible, beautiful place and you just think, oh, wow, I want to go there. Let's book and go there. And they sell these amazing places. Well, God will have to forgive me if I don't do a good job in painting a picture of this. This is a journey of a lifetime, a highway to heaven where the lifestyle is to be one of holiness. Now, there are different interpretations of what this picture means. Is this heaven itself? Is this the gateway or the journey to heaven? Is this the new earth that is described in the Bible? Is this the millennial kingdom? Well, listen, I'll leave that with you. You might have already guessed my own feelings, but the experience of this place is coming to Zion, God's city, singing for joy, everlasting joy. This isn't a place that you're going to get thrown out of. Even if you feel like a fool, you might feel that you're prone to wander. You might feel that you're caught in sin many times, easily snagged up by it. Well, the way of holiness is going to keep you on the right track. This is a place where sorrow and sighing are banished and joy is like a crown sitting on your head. Maybe this is the best way to close our time and pull these two chapters together. I want you to imagine that you have two posters in front of you in the travel agency of life. The first one, oh, it's a horrible one of pitch and tar and burning and blood and nettles and weeds. The second is a poster of joy and blossoms and strength and healing. The first is where God is judging. The second is where God is glorious and God is majestic. And yet the first looks so appealing on the surface again. When you look at it, it has strongholds, it has fortresses and it has nobles. And yet God is left out. It is a world as it is now, with potential, but doomed. And the second is a picture which at second glance, I'd say it's really hard. It's full of persecution. It's full of sorrow. It's full of sighing. Foolish people making fun of them. A wilderness even, people limping along and suffering, and yet it's a world where God is present, guiding, giving shelter, drawing those who he has redeemed through God's death, Jesus' death, drawing the people he has redeemed through Jesus' death on the cross, a city of Zion. Here's how Jesus puts it. I want you to listen to uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 7 and verses 13 to 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Do you see the relationship now between chapter 34 and chapter 35? It might be a little bit like one of those little plastic rulers that you would do it one way and it had one picture and you would turn it the other way and it has a different picture, one angle and another angle. If anyone knew that the broad road led to destruction, do you think anybody would walk on it? The problem is that people only look at it maybe in one way. It takes a deeper and a different angle, deeper thinking and a different angle to look past what we can see to begin with. And it takes a lot of help from the book of the Lord. Will you commit to the narrow path? Will you commit to that deeper look and see the world for what it is, heading for destruction? Decide to follow Jesus. Ask him to forgive you for living for yourself for living according to a lie, for following the ways of this world for way too long. 
ask him to redeem you, to ransom you, as verse 9 says, or verse 10 says. And that's because Jesus did die to redeem us when he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. But you still need to make a decision to follow him. Don't put it off. Act now, but at least don't say that you've never been warned. And for those who are listening who are redeemed, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He began your faith and he will bring it to completion. Keep on the highway of holiness. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we just want to thank you so much that you tell us not to be afraid. You tell us to have courage. You tell us to be strong. Thank you so much, Lord, for those incredibly motivating words and encouraging words, comforting words. Thank you, Lord, that you will bring us home. But we pray for one another now. We pray that you will help us to shine brightly for you. Encourage other people to walk on that highway of holiness as well. Lord, to be exposed to the futility of their lives and Lord, to want to follow you. Lord, your ways are best. Your ways are above our ways, higher than our thoughts. Your wisdom is better than our wisdom. Lord, we thank you that you give us our wisdom through your word and you apply it to our hearts by your Holy Spirit. We pray for anybody listening who's wondering about whether to take that decision. Please, we pray, Lord, that they would come to you in repentance and in faith, that you would welcome them with open arms forgive their sin, wash them clean, and give them that guaranteed place in heaven. Lord, thank you too for the rest of us. We pray for those part of the Living Room Church. We just ask that you will help us to live for you each day. Lord, looking forward to being with you, not held back. Lord, not discouraged by what things might be going on in our lives, but Lord, encouraged that we are continuing on toward you. And Lord, we ask for purity, that you would have a church that is holy and pure and following you. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 17.9 billion people. Who will you reach?